our webinar today entitled Cannabis Antagonist, Disgraceful Downfall and Promising Prospects. Wonder pills against obesity and substance abuse abruptly disappeared from the market over a decade ago. Researchers, like our guest today, are now trying, <laughs> well, maybe not quite her, but researchers around the world are trying to revive them for new applications. Um, Dr. Linda Klumpers grew up in the Netherlands and completed a PhD in clinical pharmacology at Leiden University Medical Center. Her research has been focused on the clinical pharmacology of cannabinoids, doing some very interesting works in humans. She is one of those people who has devoted pretty much her entire career to this field with over 14 years of experience, authoring various peer-reviewed publications um, in, the, in the primary literature as well as book chapters. She's received numerous honors and awards, including um, the British Journal of Clinical Pharmacology's prize. And in 2016, she founded this very interesting company called Canify to help patients and clinicians with products and science um, and online tools to customize their cannabis education. And recently in 2018, Dr. Klumpers formed uh, Verdient Science in partnership with clinical pharmacologist, Dr. Michael Tagan, someone who I know and have worked with on pharmacogenomics projects as well. Sounds like a stellar team that Linda is, is working with. Uh, coming up for CAN, we hold journal sessions uh, the last week of every month. And coming up in May, we have Monica Tang, PharmD, uh, who um, I saw speak at Columbia University last year. She's very knowledgeable on the pharmacist side of cannabis. We'll have on June 30th, Rod Kite, who is a lawyer. He was actually the Cannabis Attorney of the Year last year. And we have recently co-authored a paper on DUI um, analysis and, and regulations on cannabis that should be coming out soon. I'd highly recommend coming to Rod's presentation as well. It's a little bit different than some of our typical presentations. And then on July 29th, we'll feature Shannon Swantech, which um, we'll discuss more things related to quality control and analysis of cannabis. Um, you should also know that select presentations from the canceled Philadelphia meeting will be held online in partnership with Cannabis Science and Technology, May 6th and 7th. Our registration link will be posted to that. CAM proceedings from San Diego were published this month in partnership with Analytical Cannabis. So if you didn't attend the meeting, you can download these free abstracts um, and the link will be posted in the chat. Um, and if you haven't joined yet, please join CAM today. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Heidolf North America, Perkin Elmer, and Common Chemistry for making uh, this journal club possible and continuing to support CAM's activities. Which brings us back to uh, the reason we have gathered here today, and that's to have a discussion and a presentation with Dr. Linda Klumpers. Uh, Linda, are you there? Yes, and also unmuted. Hi, JN. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, you know, you've had a really long career in the cannabis space, in the industry and in science. I, I've, I've been wanting to ask you a question, <laughs> um, you know, it, and I guess the first question that everyone wants to know is how do your parents describe what you do for a living? <laughs> do they, do they understand that, you know, what role you play in the cannabis space? <laughs> yeah, they are very involved. Um, we speak regularly and also about work. So they even recognize names of people I talk about. But you know, I, I have always wondered what they would actually say to other people about what I do, because I didn't know um, until a few months ago, uh, September. Because um, part of my family, uh, and I'm excluded from that, play uh, golf. They love playing golf. And my uh, mother uh, sometimes volunteers at these uh, big golf uh, events. And uh, there was a big one, the KLM Open, where she was volunteering. And then she got to talk to a guy um, who goes to a lot of events and festivals for his work. And apparently my mom mentioned to him what I do. And he... he he, he was all into it because he, he was a big cannabis user. Um, he goes to a lot of festivals and that's actually why he did the work he was doing to do those things. And he loved my mom <laughs> and he wanted to know more about her daughter. And, uh, and then I thought, okay, so my mom actually does talk about it. And I didn't know. Oh, 
Nice, nice. Um, well, they say on the golf course is where a lot of business gets done. So that might be a good place to talk about um, clinical pharmacology in cannabis. Yeah, um, maybe I should change what I do in my leisure time. <laughs> well, you know, just a couple questions um, as people are still logging in um, before we get to your presentation. Um, and I just want to remind everyone, please feel free to submit questions now, during and after the presentation, and, and we'll do our best to get to them. But you know, you worked in actually one of my favorite cities in the entire world, uh, and that's Leiden. Um, I've taken my wife there. I've been there many times for work. I did an internship there with Arno Hazekamp in the Department of Pharmacognosy in 2006, which may have been when we first crossed paths. Um, could you, you know, talk a little bit about the school there? Because um, to me, you know, I don't feel like I can do it justice because I'm such a cheerleader for it, but you know, you did some really interesting work there. And the one that stands out to me is, uh, was a clinical study on the effects of ethanol, ketamine, THC, and morphine. And you were looking at brain scans and how these different drugs affected perception. Could you talk a little bit about that um, and your work in Leiden on that study? Sure. So um, 2006 is actually also the year that I started doing uh, my clinical pharmacology studies. And um, it's interesting because there are a lot of very good institutions in Leiden and they all do something different, but somehow they all touch each other. So what you were saying, you were at the Department of Pharmacognosy. Um, I was at the Center of Human Drug Research. Then you have Mario van der Stelt, for example. He is a professor working on the endocannabinoid system. Um, then you've got the hospitals with their patients and Professor Albert Dahan there um, doing uh, studies in, in patients like fibromyalgia was one of his publications recently. Um, <clears throat> So despite everyone doing something different, they also touch each other in many different ways. And it's just beautiful how those networks uh, form. Um, but then going back to your study. So uh, I uh, worked at the Center of Human Drug Research and we decided to do pharmaco fMRI studies. So MRI is an imaging technique that requires a machine that is requires quite some maintenance and is big and expensive and the university uh, uses those for research purposes and of course for uh, patient scanning. Um, so I used to go to the university medical hospital um, to, uh, to study these, uh, these patients there. Um, and we wanted to see, uh, because usually, classically, you put patients in a scanner, you give them a task to do, and you see what changes in the brain. Huh. Yeah, and in this case, we didn't want the patients to do, or the, the healthy volunteers to do any tasks. We just wanted to see if they take placebo versus a pharmacological compound, are we still able to see these uh, brain changes? And in this case, um, uh, changes in network connectivity. So that is what we did with um, comparing all these compounds. We didn't give them at the same time, but we, uh, mm -hmm. uh, we test these compounds versus uh, placebo and uh, looked at what happens in those brain networks. And what's really nice is that besides just doing the pharmaco fMRI, we also did other um, uh, pharmacodynamic measures. Uh, sorry for that word, but what I mean is we also looked at other effects like feeling high, et cetera, and um, then we looked how they correlated to the brain changes that we saw. So mm -hmm. this was lots of fun. What, um, maybe this is going to sound like a weird question, but which drug placebo gave the highest sort of response? Um, <laughs> you know, I, I've read stuff about how when people think a drug is more high priced, you know, it has a certain effect. So maybe I just was wondering, you know, was morphine was there more of an anticipatory effect you could see from the placebo you know was there something did any of the placebo drug groups stand out were there any big surprises there so um uh I, to be very honest i don't know but, <laughs> that's but, my favorite but, answer to a question <laughs> yeah but, uh, that, <laughs> no but but i have a few things to say to it because um uh, for example one of our team members was looking at the data and said oh look we uh, really got some uh, response here in heart rate because if you take uh, for example if you talk about thc um you get take thc you get a heart rate elevation but um yeah, we look better at the data and also the placebo data. And then I noticed that, wait, it also happens in placebo. And that, used, that actually happened to be a time point after which the, um, uh, the volunteers get, got their meal. 
and then you also have a heart rate increase. Huh. So that is the whole reason why I use placebo to even that out. Um, but back to uh, your question, I honestly have never looked at it from a drug perspective, whether particular drugs um, yeah, um, have, have a different type of placebo. Um, it is very important because there are different types of placebos for um, THC and for cannabis, and they all, of course, work in a different way uh, in terms of success rate. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, the placebo also, um, uh, the placebo response is also very dependent on uh, the type of volunteer you're including. Interesting. Oh, very, very interesting. And I imagine, you know, this type of work must have been influential for, for what you're doing now, because I can imagine if you're trying to study the effects of one drug, you have to make sure that your participants aren't on medications that could conflict with that. Um, was that, a, was that an issue in doing this trial, was finding people who, I mean, I assume we're not taking anything else? <laughs> yeah, that's or, a very good point because, um, of course, they can influence what you measure. Um, and in clinical trials, there are uh, two groups of people that you want to study, depending also on the face you're in. So I was working with healthy volunteers. You want them to be clean. Uh, so then you create a relatively homogeneous group that you are testing. Uh, but once you start working with patients, a lot of people, um, a lot of researchers don't want to include these type of people or those type of people because the dirtier your data gets, and I call that dirty, of course, the more heterogeneous your data set is, the harder it is to find differences that are influenced by your medication, by your investigative product. Um, but um, yeah, on the other hand, you also want to know, and that is actually very funny you're asking that because that's something we will discuss in the presentation. You also Excellent. want to know, yeah, what happens in real life? So you have the uh, two groups in the clinical trials, you call that the per protocol group. So what are you doing if you follow the protocol exactly? And what is your intention to treat group? Um, and those groups are very different. The one is much cleaner than the other, but it's really interesting what, to see what happens in practice. Oh, excellent. Um, fascinating. Um, well, I guess maybe one more question before we get started. Um, you know, in regards to, um, I mean, I'm sure you'll talk about this in the presentation, but, you know, was there something about, um, pharmacogenomics that decided, you know, this is why I want to study it. Was there something that you read or experienced or observed and you said, you know what, we really need to start looking into this field and this is, this is what I want to do. Um, but was there why pharmacogenomics, Dr. Klumpers? <laughs> yeah, so actually broader pharma pharmacology, uh, but pharmacogenomics is a very important part uh, of all of this. Um, it, has, it has so many different reasons and all these pieces come together eventually. Um, but, uh, and, and there's also not one decision moment because something else, uh, often people talk, uh, ask me, how did you get in to this um, field. But another question is, how did you stay in this field? <laughs> That's a, almost more important. <laughs> yeah. And, and the reason why I'm saying is exactly has to do with this topic, um, the cannabinoid antagonist, because um, I'm not sure if I'm now, you know, spoiling the story that I'm going to tell. Uh, but at some point, um, point in time, I was preparing so many studies for so many companies and they all got cancelled. Wow. My professors called me and said, like, we think you need to change your topic of your PhD. And, uh, oh. I, and I thought, and you will see in my presentation also why, I thought, I'm not going to do that. Wow. And I really did my best. And uh, I mean, that, that's worth another uh, few minutes of a story to uh, keep on doing what I was doing. And that's what I did. And eventually got a PhD thesis with uh, cannabinoid research. That's, that is incredible. You know, when most people think about roadblocks to research, they think about the U.S. I can't imagine what it'd be like. Um, I think it just ends more gravitas to, to your presentation today. So thank you so much for having this little chat before your talk. Um, but please uh, bring up your slides. Now I have to see the presentation now that I know 
Yeah. Um, you know, sort of what your struggle has been to do some of this work. Uh, so that's fantastic. Yeah, quite some struggle. Uh, let me see. Share screen. All right. Everyone, just reminding everyone online to please submit your questions, comments, um, either through the Q&A function or through the chat box, and we'll answer them after this presentation. Um, I think I need yeah. to... Yeah, it says you cannot start, start share screen while the oh. other participant is sharing. Okay. There yeah. you go. I have clicked the button. It's your turn to click a button. I see. Let's do some magic. Oh, there we go. And share. Can you see my screen? Looks great. Okay. I hope that uh, the screen is um, well, yeah, well visible. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, please give your undivided attention to our guest speaker today, Dr. Linda Klumpers. Please take it away. Thank you very much, Jayan. And uh, also, I, I saw like more than 30 people here. So thank you all for being here. I think uh, if you actually come up with questions and talk to me uh, at the end of this presentation, that will be, well, the most people I've spoken to in the past two months, I think, since this uh, whole uh, COVID situation started. Um, so yeah, quite a disgraceful downfall and promising prospects um, that I spelled wrong. But I did not spell cannabinoid antagonists wrong. I, uh, instead of cannabis antagonists, cannabinoid antagonists is actually what we're going to talk about. Um, let me see, how can I go to my next slide though? Oh, there we go. So first I want to, because everyone has a different background, um, I wanted to start really basic to make sure that we're on the same page. Um, our body functions uh, by all kinds of mechanisms and uh, that happens um, by compounds, by drugs, um, acting via um, uh, targets and uh, these are proteins and mostly these proteins are uh, receptors so what happens is that this compound called a ligand binds to a receptor uh, then you get a whole signaling cascade and that eventually leads to some sort of effect and you probably have heard about this regularly uh, you might even know i'm not showing it yet but some names of molecular systems so indeed, the cannabinoid system is uh, one of those. Uh, maybe you've heard about dopamine, serotonin, et cetera, et cetera. And um, if you want to um, uh, change an effect, in, target an, a particular effect, then there are, you can see in this whole cascade that there are various points um, on which you can influence this cascade to influence the effect. And um, what I would like to focus on for now is the ligand and uh, receptor. Um, in the first place, uh, you can of course uh, choose different types of uh, ligands uh, to change an effect. You can also um, decide which receptor you want to target to change a particular effect. And uh, number one is ligand, so let's start with that one. Um, and there are different types of ligands. Um, so you have ligands that bind to a receptor. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but I will point at it now. Um, here we start with uh, an agonist, a full agonist, and if you give a particular effect at the receptor with an agonist, yeah, you'll get a 100% effect. Um, if you take another ligand uh, that gives a partial effect, you call that a partial agonist. And THC is a partial agonist at the CB1 receptor. You can also take a ligand that binds to a receptor and that blocks the thing and then nothing happens. You call that an antagonist. Um, often confused with an inverse agonist, which is um, a compound that binds to the receptor and then a negative effect takes place. That's an inverse agonist. I have not uh, put a picture of that here, but we will get back to it. So it's an important concept to uh, understand. Antagonist blocking inverse agonist is an inverse effect. So the action at the receptor depends on which ligand binds, but also on where the ligand binds. And here I've got a picture that's maybe not too clear. I'm also not sure if you can read the whole uh, screen. Oh, because I see Jehan here and I love to look at his face, but he's also in front of some of the text. <laughs> so I can move you around. 
And um, here I've got a gay biologic channels. Um, these are ion channels and you can see uh, here, for example, that GABA very selectively binds between the alpha and the beta subunit of this receptor and then a particular effect happens. However, if you have other compounds like alcohol binding to the gamma subunit here or benzodiazepines, barbiturates, they all give different effects um, and they also all bind uh, on different places of the receptor. So you have orthosteric places and allosteric places from Greek, uh, orthos is, is the right, allos is different. If you're not right, you're different. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the orthosteric modulators typically then the, the, the agonist that binds to the right place and gives the right effect. And the allosteric compound actually typically doesn't really do anything unless uh, someone else is around. So um, an effect depends on um, which ligand binds and where it binds on the receptor. And now the most important part is which receptor are we binding to? Now, and then I wanna show you some example here um, of the serotonin system. Uh, you've got all kinds of uh, subtypes of um, serotonin receptor uh, here. Um, 5-HT stands for serotonin. Uh, so 5-HT1 till 5-HT7. Um, yeah, which one to target for which effect? Well, let's first look at these uh, subgroups of receptors because they're also under those classes, there are other subtypes. So you have 5-HT1A, 1B, etc. And uh, depending on which of these receptor subtypes you target, you can target different types of effects. So for example, the 5-HT1A receptor, uh, you might have heard about that um, a lot also uh, in relation to cannabinoids, is associated with anxiety and depression effects. But for example, the 5-HT1D is um, associated with migraine. Well, this sounds really uh, interesting and something you can work with. Um, but the problem is that the cannabinoid system only has two receptor subtypes. Um, and that means that if you want to target one, uh, you target many effects at the same time. So what are we talking about? A CD1 receptor is typically a, a neurotransmitter. Um, so it means it is uh, located on brain cells or neurons, um, endothelial tissue, uh, adipocytes. And the CB2 receptor uh, is mainly involved in immunomodulation. Um, so glia are particular brain cells that um, are involved in, in immunomodulation, um, etc. And then another problem is that the most well-known effects, uh, so the psychoactivity and sleep and nausea, everything, are all attributed to that CB1 receptor. So the problem is, if you target that one subtype of receptor, you target a lot of effects, so it's pretty dirty. Um, and, and that is one of the challenges of the endocannabinoid system. So um, synthetic cannabinoid agonists were already discovered in the 1960s. And uh, around 30 years later, the endocannabinoid system was discovered. So when that system was discovered and you actually know what to target, pharmaceutical companies started thinking, hmm, that is interesting. We can do something with that. And um, what can we do? Well, if we know that these agonists uh, can cause psychotic symptoms, munchies, substance abuse, and you want to antagonize those effects, then maybe we can uh, treat psychosis, yeah? make antipsychotic agents, anti-obesity agents, uh, agents for um, uh, addiction uh, problems. Um, but if we think back of all the effects that one receptor causes, and now we're talking about the CB1 receptor, um, why do you use people THC? Why do they use cannabis? It is because it makes them feel good. So if you start antagonizing it, uh, maybe people will not so feel good. Um, nonetheless, uh, this is a very uh, interesting group of medications. Uh, potential medications and a lot of people started uh, developing these. Um, well, I wanted to put this photo first because you all know him probably. Uh, uh, it, this is uh, Mr. Professor Macrianis and he gave a presentation uh, at the Journal Club uh, of your society in October last year. 
uh, a very interesting presentation, I can uh, recommend it. So he started uh, developing all these interesting ligands to the cannabinoid receptors, but he was not the only one. <laughs> there were quite some companies uh, that also uh, started uh, and other organizations starting uh, to develop this. And there was one person that I uh, wanted to particularly mention, and that is uh, this Mr. Um, like this, uh, Hoffman. And uh, Mr. Hoffman is uh, pretty known for the compound range uh, GWH. And uh, these are also found in uh, recreational products um, called Spice, um, with all kinds of fancy names, K2, Scooby Snacks, in colorful packaging. Uh, well, those are mainly compounds uh, that, that, that came from him. And uh, well, they, they developed agonists and antagonists, and these antagonists were especially uh, interesting. Uh, and very uh, many different types of antagonists were developed. Um, and I just figured out how to minimize that screen. So uh, of course, uh, selective for the receptor, CB1, CB2, uh, the neutral antagonists that we were just talking about, inverse antagonists, antagonists that. Um, yeah, act in the peripheral mainly, uh, so very lipophilic agents. Uh, so all kinds of different types of antagonists were developed, but there was only one antagonist that made it to market, and that was Remonabond. So uh, while Remonabond was developed, um, it was um, uh, known as uh, SR 141716, developed by uh, Sanofi, as a French pharmaceutical company. It came to the market in Europe under the name Acumplia, and it would have gotten to the market in the United States under the name C-Multi. Uh, but that didn't happen. Uh, Rimonobons uh, were uh, 20 milligram uh, tablets, and uh, the indication was as an adjunct to diet and exercise for the treatment of obesity and overweight patients in people with uh, an associated risk factor. So it can be uh, diabetes, for example. So what are we talking about? Um, well, uh, the BMI or body mass index um, is an uh, index that uh, measures your weight uh, over roughly your uh, body surface area. And if you have a BMI between eight and a half and 25, you're considered healthy. Uh, you're considered overweight between, uh, so everything above 25 and 30. And then you have different gradations of uh, being obese. Um, so these people with uh, 40 are, for example, morbidly obese. And um, uh, this is associated with all kinds of uh, risk factors. So um, Remote Bond came on the market uh, for this group of obese people, as well as people who were on the high side of being overweight, but who also had an associated risk factor. Um, and uh, so what does it do? Well, Remotabond induces weight loss. Uh, there were several clinical trials that showed it. After one year of treatment, it would deliver, compared to placebo, around five kilograms of weight loss. We're talking here about people that were uh, about uh, 100 uh, kilograms uh, heavy. And for the uh, Americans, well, you're a scientist, but still 2.2 um, uh, uh, pounds uh, per kilogram. Um, and uh, in about uh, half of the people um, from the Rio Monobond group, they had a 5% weight reduction, uh, 20 for placebo, and 10% weight, weight reduction, about a third for Monobond or quarter, and 8% uh, for placebo. But weight loss was not the only thing that Ramonabond did. It would also improve metabolic values. So HDL cholesterol, uh, triglycerides, and in people with diabetes, it would improve their uh, blood sugar level. And the interesting thing was that these improvements of metabolic parameters were not uh, necessarily uh, associated uh, with the weight loss alone. Because if you lose weight, then typically your metabolic parameters will also show positive effect. But this was actually stronger than just the weight loss alone. Uh, for around, about 50% of these improvements, it was not uh, caused by the weight loss. Then, those were the therapeutic effects, but Remonabond also has psychiatric side effects. And you might know where this is going to because we just uh, discussed that with the, the smiley and the not really smiley. Um, yeah, um, pretty regularly depression um, was a, a side effect, uh, suicidal ideation uh, as well. 
And the risk uh, was about twice as high in the remote bond uh, group than in the placebo group. And it was especially a higher incidence in patients with, uh, who already had suicidal ideations or who had it in the past as well as a depressive disorder, as well as um, an absolute higher incidence in patients with these comorbidities. Well, at market authorization, and now we get back to uh, the part that we discussed um, with Jehan before this presentation, uh, and that is, um, that uh, the suicidal ideation with remote bond uh, first placebo group was about one to one, uh, with one a successfully completed suicide um, uh, during this period. So this is all clinical trial based. But then after market authorization, uh, when looking at the materials again, uh, the data, there were five completed suicides in the remote bond group, and only one in a placebo group. Well, these um, benefits and risks have to be outweighed. And uh, the EMA came with a risk benefit analysis uh, in 2009, January. And uh, the EMA is the European equivalent of the FDA. Uh, I say European and what I mean the European Union because that's not entirely the same as the European continent. And um, this happened about uh, one and a half years after Sanofi, uh, so the developer of this uh, drug, already dropped the FDA application because of the negative feedback that they, um, that they received. Um, so did the risks and the benefits, um, yeah, uh, <laughs> were, they, were they equal? Which one won? Uh, well, EMA suspended the market authorization um, of Remonabond, uh, therefore the disgraceful downfall um, of this type of drugs. Because what happened was that uh, Remonabond was, as you could see, um, doing different things on the market than it was doing during the clinical trials. Uh, it was actually in practice used for, sh used for shorter periods of time. And uh, that results in um, quicker side effects, but not necessarily the beneficial effects, because you saw that these beneficial effects only um, were reported after one year of treatment. They take a lot of time, whereas the psychiatric side effects already show up uh, um, between uh, one and three months uh, of using this drug. Um, and then something else, and you don't need to go through all this text, uh, but it is that the doctors who were prescribing Ramona bonds were surveyed and they said that we um, comply with the regulations of um, uh, uh, not prescribing this drug to patients with uh, an elevated risk. And this was um, something that was put in the product label uh, after it was already on the market, after about a year, um, it was seen like, oh, there are these uh, risk groups of um, suicidal ideation and depression, so we should not give this to these patients. However, what was seen in practice is that even though this was uh, clearly communicated to the physicians and they said they understood it, um, there was still a concomitant use of these antidepressants between 6 and 20% of all the people using remote bonds. So yeah, it's still prescribed to the vulnerable. Yeah, so I already said disgraceful downfall because it was not just Ramona Bond uh, that was taken off the market. In fact, all these companies developing these antagonists. <laughs> yeah, I saw Jay on applauding. They, uh, yeah, the plug was pulled out and they were not developed anymore. And uh, yeah, there went my PhD thesis. <laughs> um, uh, but no, not quite, because there were reasons why I continued with studying uh, this field, and I was very lucky to be able to. Um, but yeah, because of uh, of, of this disaster, uh, there was a lot of uh, non scientific things involved, like legal stuff, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But this whole yeah class of medications came off the market. Uh, but was that actually the only option to discontinue the development of these drugs? Well, you might have heard from me between the lines, I don't think so from a scientific perspective. Uh, and there are a few reasons uh, why I think that. Um, there were quite some things that could have been done differently. Dosing, regulations, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I will go into these now um, separately per slide to tell you why I think that there's still hope for this group of drugs. So let's start with dosing. I'm going to show you four graphs um, of four different um, antagonists 
And what you can see is uh, on the x-axis, there is the dose of the drug given. And on the y-axis is the reduction rate of the effect. So we have to imagine that these antagonists um, uh, reduce uh, the effects of cannabis because they are antagonistic uh, of the uh, 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 antagonistic uh, on the CB1 receptor. And if you give these compounds to a healthy volunteer, you won't see anything. Uh, but if you first give them um, uh, the, the blocker and then you give them uh, a THC, uh, you'll see a reduction of the effects. And that's what we're looking at. And two typical effects that you can get with THC um, caused by uh, uh, CB1 activation are uh, the solid line, that's the heart rate, heart rate increase, and then feeling high, which is the dotted line. And what you see here is that uh, these are two different effects. They are uh, being mediated in different places of the body. And you see that these effects do not follow a parallel line, right? They are um, kind of, yeah, uh, close together, going further away from each other. And uh, what this means is that there are various doses on which two effects can be closer together. So you give the same dose and same effect level happens or further apart from each other. So with a dose adjustment, what I'm trying to say is try to change the dose to see if you are able um, to separate uh, two effects from each other as much as you can so that you have an optimal treatment effect and um, a low, uh, relative low side effects. Um, you can do that for various drugs. And this is just one, one way. Maybe it's not the ideal, but this is one reason, uh, one thing that should have been found out. And with Ramona Bond, that was not studied well at all. Um, I don't know of any modeling studies because that's typically what you do. You, you test a few doses. You are not able um, to test every dose exists, so you test a few, then you put them in a mathematical model, and then you see um, how it behaves for the missing doses. And you could have done this for a monobond where only five milligrams and 20 milligrams were used. Um, and, and yeah, uh, uh, that's, that's one thing you, uh, that could have been done differently. Um, and the second thing is, in, yeah, <laughs> I'm a scientist, but improvements of regulations or enforcement. And the reason why I'm saying it is because of this statement, this long statement that we saw before that was literally taken from um, one public report from the EMA. And um, in the statement you read, the doctors say, yes, we, we comply with what the label says, but in practice, that's not what's happening. And that hurts patients. And um, what I'm thinking is there is something wrong. I mean, I am not um, a, a proponent of having lots of regulations, but there is an issue here. If doctors saying they do one thing, but they're doing something else, they could do it for anything. Um, where are the checks here? Where are the pharmacists actually here? What are, what is their role? Because they see all these, these, these medications uh, going together. Uh, we need to understand uh, what is going wrong and it needs to be fixed. And you can't just take a particular medication off the market, I think, because yeah, people don't know how to handle it. it uh, I don't know. It just feels wrong to me. There's something wrong about the system that needs to be fixed. Maybe it's the mindset of people. I don't know what it is, but something needs to be fixed here. Uh, then something else is that uh, patient groups should be carefully chosen. So, um, in one of these EPAR reports from the EMA, it was said that, yeah, we have to take remodelment off the market because there is no real subgroup that we could find uh, that has benefit from uh, this medication. No, uh, that is maybe because it's not there or it's maybe because it wasn't studied. Actually, at the time of um, this uh, medication going off the market, a group in the United States was doing uh, research with um, uh, Ramona Bond's uh, on schizophrenic patients. They called it a pilot study because they couldn't finish the study and eventually they only had five um, people uh, in the treatment group and five in the placebo group. But what they found was nothing conclusive, but there was a trend of um, improvement for these patients. So a lot of schizophrenic people, uh, also because of their medications, have overweight or obesity. Um, but what's very interesting, and I put it in italics here, is that no severe adverse psychiatric effects were found. So maybe in the healthy obese people, uh, let's say with no psychiatric um, uh, history, it might give um, side effects uh, that are of psychiatric nature, but maybe this is different for other groups like schizophrenic groups or other patient groups. Um, so uh, depending on who you give it to, it might give different effects. So that's something else to look into. 
Then we go to uh, the compound selection. Uh, the compound selection should be uh, carefully done. Uh, maybe you remember the slide where we said, well, there is a selectivity for the receptor. You have um, a neutral versus in, uh, in inverse agonist, uh, antagonist um, compound. Well, anyway, so which compounds are we using? Remodelbond turned out to be an inverse agonist um, and not a uh, neutral antagonist. Um, and um, when we look at this uh, picture, it's pretty complex if you don't get it right away. Uh, I probably didn't explain it well enough. Uh, so here on the x-axis, we see the um, uh, effect on heart rate. Yeah, so you give uh, cannabis and then you uh, suppress it uh, with this antagonist. So for example, here you see 60% supp uh, suppression of the heart rate, of the maximum heart rate effect. And then here on the y-axis, you see that an other effect is plotted against this heart rate effect, and that is feeling high. And why we chose these two effects is that heart rate is considered peripheral effect, uh, and uh, feeling high is a central effect. And what you see here, for example, with these green triangles is, um, that uh, this compound uh, called uh, TM38837 um, is able to inhibit uh, the heart rate uh, by about 60% at a dose, that's 100 milligram, whereby the feeling high effect is not even 10%. And if you look at remodelbond, you can only achieve a peripheral effect that is 80% if you also get a feeling high effect that is about 80%. Um, so, what I'm trying to say here is that you might be able to, for example, uh, have improvement of metabolic parameters without trying to affect that brain and trying to get these um, central side effects uh, by just giving a different compound. And uh, so this is about uh, the location of where it is active, uh, but you can also look at um, agonist versus antagonist. Um, because we just said remodelant behaves as an inverse agonist, uh, but if we uh, look at neutral antagonists, they will behave differently. And uh, this was unfortunately not done in human, but in rodent. And um, here we see at the uh, x-axis the compounds given. So a little plus means uh, that this compound is given. Um, so this is a vehicle that means nothing. Uh, remodelant and then the neutral antagonist and then we see that um, these animals um, can get a reward. If they get the inverse agonist remonobonds, um, they will stop uh, seeking reward. And um, here you see that the neutral antagonist uh, doesn't do that. But, and, and, and then you can, you can uh, uh, see this as that, uh, for example, uh, the remonobonds group is not motivated to get a reward. Eh? Uh, it's, of course, a, a very big translation, but if uh, people are depressed, uh, they might not really uh, want to do anything. Um, and in this case, maybe the animal was kind of depressed and didn't want to get a reward, um, which was a sugar pellet. Who doesn't want a sugar pellet? Well, um, but then uh, if we look here at the weight gain, uh, you see that um, there was a decrease of weight for uh, both the uh, inverse agonist and the antagonist, and it was about uh, the same rate. So what we're trying to show here um, is that uh, there might still be a, uh, a therapeutic effect, but that the side effects are not that big. Even if you couldn't translate, because I understand that you might think, oh, this is far-fetched, um, what we're trying to show here is that the effects of the neutral antagonist are different from the effects of the inverse agonist. And that is the important message here. So uh, careful compound selection is very important. Then we go to the uh, last reason that I gave. Uh, different indications should be considered um, because uh, sometimes it's just a matter of, yeah, there are risks, but the benefits aren't good enough. Well, if you find better benefits for the same risks even, uh, then maybe it's worth it. So um, which indications are there? Well, we already went over this, eh? they're antipsychotic. We've only discussed the obesity and smoking cessation. There's another important one that we did not discuss, and that is very actual now because one company is working on it. And that is that uh, cannabis agonism also can cause intoxication. And for intoxication, you need an antidote. So I see Jehan's eyes going <laughs> wide open. 
And I can imagine that because a lot of people are working in this field because uh, the agonists, uh, so cannabis and um, uh, THC, and they're all used for medication. So is this intoxication really a problem? Yes, it is. Um, so here is a graph of um, a doctor. Um, he made that, Andrew Monty in Colorado, where I'm based as well. And he started counting the cannabis-related emergency department visits because he is an emergency uh, physician at uh, one hospital in Colorado. And uh, these numbers have been uh, going up over the past time. And yeah, you just see that after the legalization in Colorado, which happened around 2014, the number of the emergency department visits has skyrocketed um, from phytocannabinoids. And these were people uh, using inhalations, people using edibles, um, adults, children, all kinds of people. So people who come in, there's nothing really you can do to treat these symptoms. You can just tell them to, you know, calm down and give something against those symptoms, but there's nothing you can do to actually do something about the, the entire, uh, the, the real problem, uh, which is, yeah, the, the problem being that these uh, CB1 um, receptors are being targeted. So you can do things uh, around it, um, but nothing else. And then there's a second problem, and that's given there, phyto and synthetic cannabinoid intoxication. That's the synthetics. So we just uh, talked about Professor Huffman, um, who designed compounds that you find back in uh, oregano, <laughs> this sprayed with uh, synthetic cannabinoids. And I don't know what they're selling, but it's not really going through the quality control. Um, and the problem is that these products have not been testing in you, is tested in humans, and they can have horrible side effects even leading to deaths in the US and Europe. So when you have maybe you've heard about the zombie apocalypse in um, New York a few years back um, where a lot of people were just on the streets and yeah couldn't really do anything with them um, and uh, they, 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 they get all kinds of organ failure and uh, yeah a cannabinoid antagonist potentially can um, act as an antidote for this. I'm not convinced that this is 100% the case because you don't always know what is in it. So um, if these compounds are really working very strongly on the CB1 receptor, that might be the case. But if there's contaminants or they're actually having off-target effects, then yeah, uh, cannabinoid antagonists might not work. But at least it's, it's one idea that could have been tried out. So um, these are the things that could have been done better. And we're talking about now uh, more than 10 years ago that Ramona Bond went off the market and all this, um, yeah, uh, development was halted. But what is happening nowadays? So it's hard to sometimes find which compounds are being uh, under investigation um, by companies. And I uh, found a few here. Uh, so uh, Opiant is actually using um, a, a Sanofi compound. Sanofi was previously called Sanofi Aventis, therefore AVE1625 that we also worked on uh, the Center for Human Drug Research. Um, it's now uh, um, being um, studied for acute cannabinoid overdose. Uh, and you see some other compounds as well. Uh, one compound that's even being uh, developed by two different companies for two different indications. You see that the indications given here are not the same as the indications necessarily um, that uh, Ramona Bond came, for, uh, came on the market for. And you can also see that the phase of these are yeah, preclinical. There's nothing really going on in clinical studies right now. And that is very unfortunate. But uh, also because there are some company, uh, companies studying these uh, compounds nowadays, I'm really hopeful that they will go to clinical studies uh, soon because I think this is a very interesting group of compounds. I think they uh, really uh, are worth uh, studying, understanding what their uh, potential is. And yeah, I'm just very curious to see uh, what will uh, happen with this. Uh, and I'm also very happy to uh, take any questions from you. Excellent presentation. Thank you so much. And we do have a couple questions from the audience as well as myself and so if you're sitting at your keyboard please um, send in your questions so our first one um, is from Mark Scaldown um, uh, one of our best question askers in the business um, who asks about uh, won't those heterocyclic antagonist compounds have a multitude of targets in vivo and be metabolized into what I'm going to add here potentially toxic byproducts. And so, you know, what type of non-target activity 
does Ramona Bent have? And I believe the question is asking about, you know, when these drugs are metabolized, they turn into other things. And, and maybe you could kind of comment on that um, with any of the antagonists, I'd say, but Ramona Bent especially. Yeah, I think that's a very good question because what we saw a few years back with Vial, uh, which was a Portuguese company and uh, they came with a drug on the market uh, with a fine inhibitor. And uh, up to that time, there were already 18 studies done with fine inhibitors and they all went really pretty well. Uh, but then uh, this uh, study was not designed uh, very carefully, had off-target limits, uh, which was actually discovered by um, Mario van der Stelt at Group in Leiden and who got a science publication out of it. Uh, so I can see that this is a very valid um, um, uh, uh, concern. And something else uh, why this is a very valid concern is that many of these antagonists like Remonabond, but especially the 3M3837, uh, TM3 has an incredibly long half-life. So it stays in your body forever and you need to make sure it is safe. Yeah, it had a half-life for days. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, and then, and then for the non-pharmacologists here, if you want to make sure that a drug is out of your body as far as you can, you take um, um, a four and a half times the half-life. So uh, if you want to be clean, let's say, you have to wait for four weeks until it's gone. Um, Holy cow. Yeah, but uh, to be honest, Mark, um, it's a very good question, but I would not uh, know exactly. Um, I've never heard of toxic byproducts from uh, uh, um, Remonabond's antagonism. And um, uh, I think that if there would be these toxic byproducts, they it would never have gotten on the market. Um, in fact, I was also preparing um, a CD2 antagonist study, uh, and we were about to start, and then some of those type of toxic data came in from animal studies, and we're not um, able to proceed with that, unfortunately, because that's very promising as well. So, uh, no, I, I don't know of uh, these toxic byproducts. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, as you know, the cannabis plant produces a lot of compounds. Um, and some of those compounds aren't very good at stimulating our cannabinoid receptors. They have other targets. THCV is on, um, you know, the audience's mind. Obviously, this um, is an inverse agonist or selective antagonist of, of CB1, depending on, you correct me if I'm wrong, whose hands it is in and whose lab it is in. It, it can act a little weird. But Shelley McKay is asking, you know, you know, THCV might be useful in treatment of metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes because, um, you know, it, it hasn't been documented that it has similar adverse events um, like, like Ramona Band. So have you studied THCV? Uh, what are your thoughts on THCV as a competitor potentially to Ramona Band, which, which seems like what our, our participant Shelley McKay is asking? Yeah, no, that's a uh, very good thinking because uh, indeed it can act as uh, an, an, uh, an antagonist. Uh, but uh, we have not studied it. Uh, I can imagine that uh, pharmaceutical um, yeah, world is less interested in, uh, in compounds that are naturally occurring in a plant and therefore it's not studied. I would be super interested in studying it though um, because, uh, yeah, I, I, I will never, and it's all anecdotal, but <laughs> I know people who have uh, used it and they came back to me to report exactly the same particular side effects independent from each other. And I was just amazed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was pretty interesting. But uh, I think that um, um, this has never been studied in humans for that purpose. And I think it would be interesting to do it, though. Okay. Um yeah. Regarding the ER visits, um, you know, uh, I think uh, what I, what I want to know here is, where is there evidence? I mean, obviously, this is probably a poly substance using population that went into the ER. And so when you see this type of data, and you're looking at it with your clinical pharmacology and your kind of pharmacogenomics background, do you see it as cannabis being a factor in the ER visit? Do you see it as a, the effect of cannabis causing it? Or do you think it might be more like there's some drug-drug interactions? Like people were drinking their whiskey, tried cannabis for the first time, or like, I feel so weird, I need to go to the hospital. Or is it a combination of all of them? I was just wondering if you kind of comment on that data to contextualize it a little bit. Because you see, you know, 750% increase. Is it all just related to THC? Or are there more subtle things at play there? And, and you know. 
Yeah, I think uh, that's it's a very good question, and um, uh, uh, the the drug drug interaction is still being studied, uh, especially for CBD. This is a big thing because it's typically used with, um, for example, anti epileptic drug, and it has been shown already that it does increase the um, concentration of anti epileptic drugs in this in this population, and um, and there will be studies on this uh, soon as well. Uh, by different groups on the drug-drug interaction with uh, THC and CBD. Um, and with regards to uh, this in particular, um, I think that it's uh, pretty noticeable that it happened indeed on a moment that uh, more THC uh, use was going on. And what I think is a real problem here is that you let people use something without educating them first. And... Um, yeah, in the country I come from, um, the Netherlands, uh, where cannabis is uh, tolerated, um, there is not as much use as in other countries where it was not tolerated, like in France, France, sorry. Um, but there's also, because people speak more openly about it, it's also mm -hmm. easier to get information that is useful for you. Uh, you see that uh, trend with uh, drugs, you see that trend with uh, sex education as well. Um, in the United States, the states with um, the highest teenage births are also uh, the states that give the least sex education. Mm. Um, so I think that education is very important here. I I'd agree, but let's stick to talking about drugs, not sex, because we shouldn't combine the two, ever. Um, sorry, that was a bad joke. Um, okay. So Regarding cannabis education, which you brought up, um, what does the future of cannabis education look like? Obviously, you're doing stuff with Canopy. You're finding out interesting things about drug-drug interactions. You know, you mentioned that education is an issue for consumers. What, what do you think the future of education is like for yeah, cannabis? Um... Uh, that is actually also asking, like, what is society going to do? Because... Uh, okay, okay, let me rephrase it then. If you could wave a magic wand and change yeah. something about cannabis education, what would it be? Okay, that is exactly why I started uh, Canify. Because uh, what I saw is that uh, education is typically very opinionated. Um, a lot of people uh, gave education because they wanted to sell their product or they wanted no one to use cannabis. And what I'm trying to do is really educate people in a way of this is what we know. This is what we don't know. If we don't know it, we also should just say it um, and not act as if we know it. And um, yeah, that, uh, I think that that is what uh, I would do. So as much as objective information as possible so that people can make their own choices. Very good. Um, so get back to the, the science for a second. Um, mm -hmm. Mark Scaldown is asking, um, is there any understanding of the mechanism by which blocking CB1 uh, receptors impacts anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts in the patient? Um, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah. Um, uh, that's really, really a good question because it has uh, multiple sides. Because uh, right now um, we are talking about the CB1 antagonists uh, or inverse agonists. And, um, and uh, it's, it's the same as why, uh, um, uh, why would THC have this biphasic effect of, on anxiety? Eh? You have a very low dose of THC will um, make people feel less anxious. And if you go above seven milligrams, uh, people will get uh, more anxious if they're not used to it. Uh, but on the other hand, and that's, that is CB1 receptor mediated, uh, but on the other hand, you also have uh, cannabinoids that do not work on the CB1 receptor. And I'm bringing this up, not because it's necessarily relevant for this particular question, but I'm also, I'm bringing it up actually because this is a question that I get a lot of times and a lot, that is very relevant for a lot of people to know. Namely, how CBD influences the anxiolytic effects. Um, uh, so, so if you give, make people anxious with THC, you give CBD, then it decreases that anxiety feeling. And that is, for example, something that does not necessarily go via the CB1 receptor, but via those serotonin receptors, because mm. CBD doesn't really bind to cannabinoid receptors. Um, 
at higher levels, yeah, there might have. And in in vitro, you see uh, that it it binds to this allosteric site of the receptor. Uh, But actually, the primary effects are um, on on different receptors. And, 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 yeah, that's very interesting because you have these uh, systems that uh, the cannabinoid system and all these molecular systems that do their thing, but it's not just that they do their thing on their own. They all work together. Nice. And, um, you know, as, as we're wrapping up here, um, you know, we got a couple more minutes here to talk, you know, definitely one of the worst pieces of information I've seen out there that I see a lot of is, oh, CBD stimulates, you know, cannabinoid receptors, you know, and things like this. I see this a lot. Um, but to take it a step further, I'm sure, you know, with your consulting work, your international work, you've probably have heard all, heard or seen a lot of bad advice out there. And I was just wondering if you could maybe comment on some, what is the sort of worst information, <laughs> worst advice you, you, you hear being dispensed out there? And, you know, you brought up CBD. So it brought up the idea of misinformation, <laughs> and bad ideas. Um, yeah. But you don't have to talk about CBD. I just say, you know, in general to the cannabis sciences and, and the industry you work in, what's some bad advice that you, you hear a lot of? Um, is, is there something that's reoccurring? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, many different things. And I can go to the advice itself, but I think one thing that is very important, and you just heard me saying that uh, as well for the education, is um, has some people are, are smart, some people are not so smart, and uh, you can get all kinds of uh, interesting questions, and that's okay. Um, that's really okay. In that sense, there are no really yeah um, uh, questions that are stupid. But um, what I think is the most important thing is what is someone's intention? Um, why are they saying what they're saying? Why are they trying to educate people this way or that way? Um, what is their intention? Do they try to help people or do they just try to help their own bank account or what is going on there? And I think that it's very important to understand where it's coming from because then, um, yeah, um, then you also, uh, it's easier to deal with the question itself. And um, so, for example, one thing is people saying you need to use cannabinoids every day because you might have a cannabinoid deficiency. Yeah, uh, that is a very interesting theory. We just don't know uh, if that's the case. It's very likely it's the case. We don't know who has it. We don't, we don't know these things. So, uh, and if that comes from someone who tries to help, yeah, uh, you know, you can say, well, we don't know. If it comes from a company that just tries to sell you uh, something mm. it's it's a bit of a different story so um yeah things like that are are pretty funny it's, it's more the standard thing indeed uh, uh cbd is is safe yes it's safe but depends on which product you buy um uh, indica and sativa are different like uh, those type of things nice nice um you know you've done some really good work you know your store i really appreciate you sharing us details about the challenges you faced when uh, there was the backlash against cannabinoid antagonists. You know, I, I had a similar um, experience because I was studying uh, synthetic cannabinoids, the ones that people were using, uh, a lot of the JWH compounds and the AM series, the HU series. And when they banned those compounds in the state, I no longer could do research on them. And I just got approval to study synthetic cannabinoid combinations. Um, and I had to like completely redo the thesis as well. So not as dramatic as, 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 as yours, but, you know, um, and, and I learned some things from that. Um, but from your perspective, you know, if there was, you know, we have a lot of young chemists and a lot of young researchers who work with us um, and they're facing challenges in getting into research and working in industry. What sort of advice would you give some of our younger researchers? Maybe they're just out of graduate school. Maybe they're just starting graduate school. Maybe they're just out of undergrad. And they're looking at this big ball of science and industry. <laughs> and it can be overwhelming. Um, they're going to face challenges. But what sort of advice would you give someone, you know, starting out in this field with some, that has some good training under them? Yeah. Um, the world has changed a lot. Every year it is different again. Um, so I think that a flexible attitude uh, is just uh, universally um, 
uh, required everywhere in life. <laughs> and uh, also in this field, definitely. Um, I think that it's very uh, important to stay yourself and stick with what you think is important, what your own uh, values are. Because uh, there are a lot of good people in the field. Uh, there are a lot of not so good people in the field, uh, people you can't rely on. So uh, make sure, I think that um, you can try to do everything by yourself, but I think it's really important that you uh, stay in touch uh, with certain uh, people. And that's pretty easy. I mean, uh, you and I have known each other for more than a decade right now. And uh, many other people in this field um, uh, that I know have, have been there for, for more yeah, for, for so long. Um, so it's important that you, um, uh, yeah, uh, keep, let's say, keep in contact with them, yeah. with, with people that you trust, that also you can help each other. Um, and and, and the, the field is really friendly if you find these right people. Uh, I have regular contact with amazing people in this field. I'm so happy um, with uh, a lot of the people developing this field, um, researching uh, the endocannabinoid system. They're alive. They're <laughs> <laughs> walking around us. Uh, you can you can just, uh, yeah, ask these people more about the science and, and create ideas together. There are a lot of uh, dogmas and other uh, just kind of facts in science. And if you actually try to verify these facts uh, with the researchers themselves, it's not always that black and white. Or just if you're curious, just keep on asking, keep on studying what you want to study. Don't just believe what people say, but really verify it for yourself. That, that's, that's, really, that's really good advice. I think, you know, just what I heard was, you know, be flexible and work with good people and, and have a good network of people you can work for. And also don't be afraid to contact someone who did research. I mean, I got to say the first time, like I was in a research lab and I saw, you know, this researcher's name on a door. I like froze. It was like I was meeting a rock star and I couldn't talk. I was like, Oh my God, they've published all these papers and I'm a nobody. Uh, but I asked them these questions that I thought were so stupid and basic, but you were right. They turned out not to be very clear. They turned out to have lots of gray area. Like, you know, what are allosteric modulators? How do they work? And, you know, and is it true that the binding site like CB1 works like this and that? And those questions are not always black and white as, as some freelance journalists might, might lend us to believe. Um, you know, we're, we're wrapping up with time here and I want to give you a chance. Uh, you've talked about a lot of stuff, but I'll give you uh, a chance to talk about kind of anything you wanted here. So do you have any ask or request for our audience? Any last parting words? Um, you know, do you want everyone to go out and read a certain book or, <laughs> you know, um, any, any, any asks or requests? What's your, you know, as, as a friend of mine used to say, what's your finishing move for this story? <laughs> okay, well, uh, one thing uh, that I always say, and I just said as well, be critical and ask questions. I can't say that often enough. 